Welcome to the Method Symposium on Advanced Methods and in Innovative Technologies for Evidence Synthesis. The symposium is sponsored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and Tianjing Li is the PI. My name is Meera Vishwanathan. I direct the RTI UNC Evidence Based Practice Center, and we're a Cochrane affiliate. I'm so thrilled to be able to chair this in interesting session on harms. Um, and I want to thank Tianjing Li for, present, for putting together this fabulous set of talk. I wanted to just go over the sessions. We've had two sessions already on February 16th and 23rd. If you've happened to miss them, we will have these available. Um, this session on, is on synthesizing, synthesizing harms of interventions. Uh, and the presenters are Lisa Barrow, Evan Mayo-Wilson, Riaz Qureshi, Roger Chow, Rachel Phillips, and we'll have um, a, a QA session after that, led by uh, Peter Doshi and Sue Golder. And after this, there'll be mini workshops and a suite of risk of bias assessments. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Evan Mayo Wilson. He's an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Indiana School of Public Health in Bloomington. He's also the associate editor for systematic reviews for the American Journal of Public Health. He's worked on methods for improving research transparency and openness, and we look forward to his presentation. Dr. Mayo Wilson. Thank you very much for having me today um, and to Tianjing for uh, organizing this. Um, I realized there was a bit of a gap in the title of my talk. So today I'm going to talk about uh, harms data collection and grouping, particularly with respect to clinical trials. Um, and there are some other speakers, I think, who will touch on how harms are collected and analyzed and other sorts of studies later. So one thing that's been uh, noted a number of times is that harms are badly or incorrectly or not reported in many uh, clinical trial reports. And here are some examples of uh, the way that harms are sometimes reported uh, in clinical trials. You can see words like acceptable and manageable and feasible are used. Um, and it's unclear sometimes what these terms mean. And if you can imagine for a moment what the analogous reporting would look like for benefits, if we said that the intervention was sufficiently beneficial or that it was acceptably beneficial, uh, people wouldn't accept that. We wouldn't be able to publish clinical trial reports that made such uh, kind of broad and unfounded claims as that. So it's a bit striking that we see this sort of language about harms when they're reported. There are a couple of different kinds of harms. And as we think about the reporting and the analysis of harms, it's important to keep this in mind. Some harms are actually collected and analyzed like the benefits that we have in clinical trials. So those are things that are measured for all participants in the same way. They're selected a priori. They might be described uh, in advance in a trial registration or in a protocol, and they can be analyzed and reported using pre-specified methods. So that's just about all of the benefits that we have in clinical trials. And when we have harms that are reported and that are assessed in this way, we refer to them as being systematic harms or systematically assessed harms. But then there's this other group of harms which introduce a number of complications. They're non-systematically assessed harms. These are things that might be reported spontaneously by patients. They're often reported in clinical trials based on the results. Uh, and the methods for analysis and reporting of those harms are often unclear or not specified in trial protocols. So here's what I mean about benefits and systematically assessed harms. Typically, you would have a protocol that describes what you're going to assess and when you're going to assess it. So if we were doing a trial about the management of psychosis, you might say that you're going to use the positive and negative syndrome scale and that you're going to assess uh, these symptoms at various time points. You might assess people at the time of enrollment and then at various time points after allocation. And you would see benefits described this way in a, a spirit uh, figure like this. Uh, and in other ways in trial protocols and in trial registration documents. So here's a trial registration of a drug that is used for the treatment of psychosis. And you can see here that the primary outcome is described on the uh, trial registration. Some secondary outcomes are described. We know what measure is going to be used, at what time point those measures will be assessed, etc. And in journal articles about clinical trials, we see this sort of information about those measures as well. Here you can see the number of treatment days that have passed and the uh, time at which the uh, 
primary outcome was assessed, so you can see the change from baseline uh, for each of the different treatment groups in this trial, and you can see the proportion of patients who are reporting ratings of very much or much improved uh, on a secondary outcome here in the figure on the right. So we get this information about benefits because they've been systematically collected at pre-specified time points using pre-specified outcome measures. And if you look at drug labels, or uh, better uh, described as prescribing information that comes with uh, drugs, you will see this sort of information in them as well. This is a figure that looks very much like the figure that was in the um, in the journal article about this study. It includes information about uh, the primary outcome at various pre-specified time points. Now we know that primary outcomes can be reported or misreported in a lot of ways, in part because they can be defined or redefined in many different ways. And the same is true of systematically assessed benefits uh, or systematically assessed harms. So here, for example, if we had an outcome like weight, you could assess weight in a number of different ways. You could assess it using uh, pounds or kilograms, or you could assess people's change in weight as change in BMI. You could assess that at the, as a value at the end of the study or as change since the beginning of the study. You might do that continuously as the mean value, or you might do that categorically by looking at the proportion of people who had 7% change, 15% change, 25% change, etc. And each of those different ways of assessing somebody's weight or somebody's BMI will give you a different numerical result that you can include in a trial report. So there are opportunities for cherry picking the outcomes or the results that get included in clinical trial reports. And that's the same for benefits that have been assessed systematically as well as harms that have been assessed systematically. So that part of this puzzle is understood uh, with, uh, with some reasonable degree of, uh, of certainty and knowledge at this point. But the way in which we assess harms is much more complicated and the reporting of harms is much more complicated because a lot of them are assessed non-systematically. And they're also analyzed and reported in ways that are just unclear. So here's the information that you would get uh, from the prescribing information or the, uh, the drug label for Aristrata. And here you can see that there's a bunch of information about adverse reactions in elderly people with dementia-related psychosis. We have metabolic changes. We have a number of other uh, potential side effects or harms that are associated with this drug. But it's not clear as we read this sort of information whether these have been assessed systematically or non-systematically. It's often not clear in what patient population these have been assessed, whether they apply to everybody who's taken this drug or particular subgroups of people who have taken it for particular indications. And the information we get on clinicaltrials.gov, the uh, registration website, is also a little bit difficult to interpret, though it's a little bit clearer here what's happening. So you can see here there are a number of uh, categories on the left side. We can see information about cardiac disorders, gastrointestinal disorders, infections, um, metabolism, nervous system disorders. And under some of these, we can see a number of different specific terms. So for example, under psychiatric disorders, we have drug abuse, psychotic disorder, and suicide attempts. So those have all been uh, grouped according to this category of psychiatric disorders. We can also see some information at the bottom which tells us that some of these in, uh, events were collected through systematic assessment, and some of them are terms from controlled vocabulary, MEDRA. And it's important to understand something about this Mentor vocabulary when we're doing syntheses of, uh, of harms that have been collected using this system. So non-systematic harms are collected in response to open-ended questions, and you might see terms like this. You might see uh, hundreds, potentially, of different terms that refer to systematically or, or, uh, or non-systematically assessed harms. And then you can see uh, that there are a number of different systems for categorizing and describing uh, those harms. The one that was used until the late 90s was a system called COSTART, uh, and then that got phased out and replaced by what is currently used, which is called MEDRA. So the MEDRA system has a number of different levels of analysis. Harms can be uh, recorded using what are called entry terms, and then they can be analyzed using the lowest level terms. And in MEDRA, there are uh, 70,000 of these terms, which are at that lowest level of analysis. Uh, and then you can organize those into high-level terms, high-level group terms, and system organ classes at the, at the top of this system.
And at the top of this system, there are 27 system organ classes. So you can imagine that if we were analyzing 70,000 lowest level terms or uh, preferred terms, uh, we would be getting very sparse information about most of those events. It would be very difficult to detect signals at that level of analysis. The disadvantage of organizing them into these uh, larger categories is that we lose all of that information about exactly what happened to each individual. The benefit of doing that, though, is that it might be easier to see signals at that level of analysis than it is at the lowest level of analysis, at the uh, preferred term level or at the lowest level term level. When we look at a number of different sources about information uh, of information from clinical trials, it's sometimes hard to tell why they report what got reported. Um, so here is what's called an FDA snapshot. This is a summary of information that FDA provides on its website that's uh, designed to be used by patients to help them make decisions about whether to use a drug or not. So this is the summary for Aristrata. And you can see a number of different harms that are listed here. And you can see the percentage of people in the placebo group who had these uh, harms and the percentage of people in each of the different doses of Aristrata who had these harms. So the first question you might have is, why are these harms listed rather than the hundreds of other harms that could have been listed here? And the answer is that it depends on the results. So this table is labeled in a way that's consistent with the tables in a lot of clinical trial reports. It says that these are adverse reactions that occurred in 2% or more of Aristrata treated patients and had greater incidence than in the placebo treated patients. As we look at the table in a little bit more detail, we can see that some of these harms were systematically assessed. You can only know people's weight by asking them to step on a scale and collecting that information in some systematic way. I suppose you could ask people if their uh, weight increased, but unless that was systematically assessed, uh, they might not know. So uh, you might infer at least that some of these were assessed systematically. Some of them are probably assessed non-systematically, like headache. It's unlikely that everybody was asked systematically whether they had a headache during the uh, period of the trial. And so we can infer from uh, some of these tables that these are non-systematic events. So we have different kinds of information for different events in a table like this. When we look at trial reports, it's often unclear what's been done as well. So here you can see a table from a trial report that includes a number of different preferred terms. Uh, as a reviewer, you would have to know that preferred term is referring to a particular system using MEDRA. Um, that might not be clear from a lot of trial reports. Uh, and here, at least, they have used the term uh, preferred term, but many trial reports wouldn't use that and, and give you a clear indication that these have been collected using MEDRA, even if they had. Here, you can also see the table uses some selection criteria, much like the FDA snapshot. It says occurring in at least 2% of aripiprazole treated patients. But then you see a bunch of information in the text that includes things like the majority of all episodes occurred before the second injection, generally within the first three weeks. We don't know, looking at this, whether that was a planned analysis or whether that was some post hoc analysis, whether this should be considered exploratory, whether there was some theory that might have led to that test, or whether this is just um, some exploratory uh, post hoc description of what happened in the trial. So the information that we have about harms it's really quite limited, uh, even when we have some textual description of what happened. One of the things that makes it challenging as a systematic reviewer to use information about non-systematically collected adverse events is that they're reported according to these selection criteria, which might be implicit in a table, but it's, uh, it's rarely pre-specified or described in a protocol. So you can see that there will be a numerical threshold in many cases, some cut off for reporting the number of or proportion of patients who experience the AE. In some cases, that might be 5%. In others, it might be 2%. It might be AEs that occurred in any group or uh, AEs that occurred in a particular participant group. So it might be the intervention group rather than the placebo group. And sometimes there is a requirement for some difference between groups. We've already seen a requirement that they be of greater incidence in the treated group compared with the untreated group, but it might be other criteria for differences between the groups. Um, they might be twice as frequent in some, uh, in some cases. It's also a problem as a systematic reviewer that these selection criteria are inconsistent across reports of the same trial. So here's the snapshot that we saw earlier for Aristrata, and that has a table that includes 
adverse events or harms that occurred in at least 2% of treated patients and had greater incidence than the placebo-treated patients. If we look at the drug label, though, or the prescribing information, at least one table there includes incidence of at least 5% and twice that for placebo. So uh, this is a different selection criteria. The trial registration includes events in at least 5% of patients. This is consistent with what's required under uh, the Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act to be reported on clinicaltrials.gov. So this is the selection criteria that you'll typically receive there. And in the journal article, we see a number of different selection criteria. We see 5%, we see uh, greater than 5% uh, and of uh, at least twice the rate. In the text, we see 2% in the table. So even within one report, we see in inconsistent information. We know that most non-systematic harms are never mentioned publicly. These are tables showing the proportion of, uh, of harms or the number of harms that are reported publicly and non-publicly for trials of gabapentin and quetiapin, uh, which are drugs that we looked at in the uh, MUD study. In this study, we found that in some cases, there were hundreds of harms that were being reported in non-public sources of information, and uh, only uh, a couple of harms, or in some cases, no harms that were being reported in public sources of information. And very concerning to us, that was true of both all, all harms as well as serious harms, so things that might lead to hospitalization uh, or, or require medical attention. Those were also being underreported in public sources of information. We found in that study as well that published harms data are not usable. So even when they are reported, much of the information that we get about harms can't be analyzed because we don't have the number of events that actually occurred or the denominator uh, for the number of people that are included in the analysis. So here we have data for 21 trials of gabapentin, which is uh, commonly used for neuropathic pain, and seven trials of quetiapin, which is used for bipolar depression. And you can see that for gabapentin, we had 384 harms with analyzable data in non-public sources of information, but only 62 harms for which we had analyzable data in public sources of information. That difference is present too when we think about the serious uh, harms, the serious adverse events. So we had 60 serious AEs reported in uh, non-public sources of information. That's data that would be available to the manufacturer, that would be available to regulators. Um, but only 16 of those were reported in public sources of information, typically journal articles that would be available to most clinicians and most systematic reviewers. And you see the same pattern when it comes to quetiapin. We see a lot of harms that are occurring and reported in non-public sources of information, but a very small number of them are reported in public sources of information. Even if we took uh, a term that's commonly used in many clinical trials report, like the uh, probability of experiencing one or more harms, the number of people who had a, uh, at least one uh, adverse event. If we used public sources of information, we would only be able to uh, include five out of the 21 gabapentin trials and three out of the uh, seven quetiapin trials. So even for these very broad categories that try to simplify the way in which we describe and the way in which we uh, analyze harms, it's impossible to use public sources of information to do systematic reviews and meta-analyses in many cases. Non-systematic harms are often grouped in non-public sources of information. So 21 trials of gabapentin for neuropathic pain grouped uh, in 21 trials of gabapentin for neuropathic pain and seven trials of quetiapin for bipolar depression. We saw that all of the gabapentin trials reported uh, harms that were grouped according to some of these higher categories. In two out of the four quetiapin trials, we could see that the harms had been grouped and analyzed in that way as well. But in only two out of the 15 trials that were uh, published for gabapentin, did we see grouping at those levels? And in zero out of the three published quetiapin trials that we looked at, did we see grouping at those levels? So this grouping is being done in many cases, but is not being published. When we think about the complications for network meta-analysis, uh, one of the issues that we have uh, there as well is that we get different network structures. So you can see here two different networks from a, a network meta-analysis by Andrea Cipriani and colleagues. 
And I've drawn in using red the additional connections that would uh, be available for uh, one of these networks and not for the other. So you can see the network for benefits on the left-hand side is different from the network for treatment discontinuation, which is being used as a proxy in this review for, uh, for reporting harms. So we may not know when we get different results from network meta-analyses that compare benefits and harms, whether those differences arise uh, because of uh, differences uh, in the way in which the networks are connected. Um, it, it may be that there are some methodological problems here uh, that arise as well that we need to sort out. So the implications for synthesis, uh, oftentimes what we're using in published trial reports uh, is not very good information. And uh, if we have junk coming into systematic reviews, it will be junk out. We often don't know whether harms are collected systematically or non-systematically. We may not know the number of events per person. It's often unclear whether harms have been grouped according to these higher level criteria. Uh, and the definitions are often inconsistent across studies and across reports of the same study. So uh, one question that I hope we'll continue to discuss as other speakers um, uh, add to this discussion is whether including harms in all systematic reviews might be doing more harm than good. It's become a standard in Cochrane reviews and in other reviews that we expect some information about harms, but there are fundamental differences between the ways in which harms are assessed and reported. Harms are often rare events, but that's not the only difference between harms and benefits. Many systematic reviews aren't really designed to assess harms. There are a number of challenges that arise in analyzing and reporting harms. Uh, evidence about harms is missing from most reports of most clinical trials. The reporting of harms is often biased because of selection criteria. They're reported inconsistently across reports for single trials. Um, and there are additional limitations at the trial level. So many harms are unknown before you do a clinical trial. There might be a large number of possible harms, so it might be um, impossible to specify in advance all of the things that you'd be interested in. We need to be aware, though, as we do systematic reviews, that the information that we're getting is biased, that the analysis at the lowest level may disguise important signals because they appear to be unimportant or, or we have very rare events, but grouping at higher levels may uh, increase statistical power, but it may hide information that we would be interested in. For example, if we grouped things like headache and migraine and found that there was no difference between the treatment and the um, placebo group, that uh, might disguise the fact that there is in fact a difference uh, in the more serious outcome, migraine. So uh, we need to be careful about how we analyze and group things in individual trials as well as systematic reviews. And I think the uh, evidence as you're gonna see going on is that systematic reviews are not dealing with these sorts of data appropriately in many cases. And I think as a community, we need to rethink whether what we're doing at the moment might actually be doing more harm than good. Thank you.